Yes, it is uh, 10 30 and we're beginning. Welcome all to another session of online discussion for Suchitra Film Society. This COVID induced lockdown has made most of us sit at home. Normally, we, the people from the filmmaking world and the theater, we usually wish to be among people, wish to look at the reaction of people, but we have been made to sit at home because of this COVID. Any which way, on this specific day, May 2nd, 2021, we are, have organized an online discussion as a tribute to the, a great film director, a great human being, and a great friend of Suchitra Film Society, Sumitra Bhave. This day is also the birth centenary of Satyajit Ray. We will be beginning a festival of films made by Satyajit Ray today evening at 5 p.m. on suchitra.org. And on 5th of May, we have a discussion once again with another stalwart of Kannada cinema, Girish Kasravalli, talking about the contribution of Satyajit Ray. And on this day, I would also like to inform every member who is present on this platform that Suchitra Film Society has been awarded the Satyajit Ray Award instituted by Federation of Film Societies of India. This is the first of its kind, uh, um, uh, an award which has been, um, which has begun as a, as a part of the centenary of Satyajitre. Satyajitre was a man who always supported this good cinema movement through film clubs. And uh, he was the one who inaugurated the foundation laying ceremony of Suchitra Film Society way back in 1979 and today is his centenary and we are also trying to celebrate that centenary and today as I already told you we are trying to discuss about Sumitra Bhave as a tribute to a great lady who left us all the last week of April. This COVID has taken away lots and lots of our friends we are helpless at many places. Though we, we are not even in contact, we don't even be able, we'll not even be able to look at their faces when, they, when we go there because they are wrapped in a plastic cover. This is a very a kind of a, uh, I don't know what the name I should give. This is a sad state of affair for all of us who are basically humanists who wish to talk with people through all possible mediums. Sumitra Bhave did the same. She, in her lifetime, did 17 films, lots of television films. And she was also a social worker for a long time before she came into the um, filmmaking world. All her films, but they make a specific connect with the audience because of the, its humanist values and the, uh, the kind of uh, socio-political relationship that she discusses on the film. Today, we have with her, with us, N. Manu Chakravarti, one more well-wisher friend and a, a long time associate of Suchitra Film Society and also a very good friend of Sumitra Bhave, talking about Sumitra Bhave. We, also have Sunil Suktankar, who made lots of films with Sumitra Bhave. Both of them together have made more than 16 uh, films, feature films. All of them are uh, so very beautiful and so very uh, interesting that uh, I cannot, uh, uh, without discussing Ha Bharat Maza or a film like Vastu Purush or a film like Astu, no film discussion will end, I think. Thanking Sumitra Bhave for all her contribution, I now request N. Manu Chakravarti to speak about Sumitra Bhave. Manu Chakravarti, sir, now Thank it's you. your turn. Thank you, Suresh. 
uh, good morning friends uh, uh, this tribute to sumitra bhave uh, this has been structured to create certain spaces of understanding of sumitra bhave's cinematic texts and uh, at this juncture it itself i would like to say that except for diti her last film all the films were in collaboration with sunil soktank so uh, even at certain stages if i just say sumitra bave uh, i would like you all to keep in mind that sunil soktank a sunil ji was a full fledged co director <clears throat> in fact uh, i have tried to put all my energy uh, into my attempt attempt this morning only to let uh, sumitra bhave's thematic concerns ethical positions aesthetic choices and understanding of the cultural ethos of this land emerge and i have tried to do it in as holistic a manner as possible uh this tribute does not derive its analytical method by borrowing from abstract theoretical notions of form of style of aesthetics that that film theories especially those generated in the west tend to bombard us with in fact more often than not uh, most film theories especially of recent decades tend to erase the cinematic text itself it's theory on theory on theory meta theory meta theory that the cinematic text itself disappears so i'm i'm trying to pitch my my whole essay on on the cultural ethos of this land and i think this was central to sumitra bave and sunil soktank uh i i do not go into the relative merits of sumitra bave's films by by subjecting each film to a rigorous analysis of style narrative structure not not the technological content but its uh, thematic designs the structures of narration in thematic terms uh an analysis of technique of form of style of compositional values well i think it needs to be done but this is not the occasion and so i don't do that uh, there are certain fundamental premises that uh, that frame my attempt here my essay and and that is uh, cinema with its divergent traditional practices divergent cinematic traditions has led to has led to very very fine theories too even as i say that there are certain theories theoretical positions that tend to erase the cinematic text but there are exceptional theorists who who concentrate on the cinematic text drawing theoretical positions from out of the cinematic texts but but i think uh, it's necessary especially in our parts of the world what is loosely called the third world which which includes india but third world is a is an expression of convenience which itself is a problematic choice but anyway i think we should turn to our cultural narratives cultural ethos and also look at look at the different kind of narration indian cinema is built on its own kind of narration where where our where our cultural imagination determines how we tell a story how we structure a story this why i see uh, i think it's it's very unprofitable not just unprofitable it's beyond a point absurd to invoke the european film theorists american film theorists now all those that go in the name of film theory film studies because i think we cannot have overarching categories we cannot have categories that tend to eliminate that tend to make certain contingencies contingencies of culture disappear 
so so i think i think we need to look at very very important uh, divergences continuities within a cinematic tradition and and certainly not be drawn into that vortex of an overarching film theory so i i think we should be interested in the element of heterogeneity the principle of heterogeneity it's for this matter that when we turn to films made in india africa bangladesh iran we must we must try to try to evolve a different set of theoretical notions in fact not even a different set different sets of theoretical notions and and also and also try struggle to create our own notions of form of style it's in the sense that uh, indian cinema in all our languages that indian cinema displays a diversity and a diversity which i think is uh, is as uh, important heterogeneous as varied complex rich as our musical traditions and uh, literary traditions go in fact when we deal with our musical traditions we don't refer to those theoretical positions of western classical music we have we have our own notions so the time has come for indian film theory to try to see what what constitutes the nature of a cinematic experience in in the indian context in fact the very design of storytelling framing of characters the construction the build up of emotional content the construction of images composition lighting even when you turn to cinematography so our notions of realism our notions of reality i i do not think we need to measure it to alien standards so this struggle i i think has begun in many of us who write on cinema but i think it needs to be nuanced in fact accentuated to see if if one can arrive at at an indian theoretical position as far as cinema is concerned so uh i i these are the premises in fact uh, these these are the uh uh philosophical positions that i have adopted and not just what i have adopted now as i'm going to do an analysis of sumitra bhave and sunil suktankar's films but but in my own writings i have i've struggled how successful or not is a different matter to arrive at a certain kind of a cultural narrative of indian cinema so as i mentioned except for diti that sumitra bhave made in 2019 sunil suktankar is is a very important aspect of sumitra bhave's films uh suchitra film society screened uh, six films uh vastupurush devrai bhada habarat maza samhita and astu i shall be referring to these films but but in relation to several other films because i think it's through them that it is possible to trace sumitra bhave's creative journey uh, beginning with the first major film uh, dogi made in 1995 and also to conceptually comprehend conceptually comprehend her thematic concerns and and the kinds of aesthetic choices she made and of course her philosophical positions so i think i think i begin with uh, 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 dogi made in 1995 and try to analyze it with bada that was made in 2006 my my own uh, reading is that the two films dogi and bada are also be, to be juxtaposed with samhita that was made in 2013 for for these three films in in very very diverse ways deal with the existential challenges and dilemmas of women interestingly the the first two films are deeply rooted in the feudal rural context 
while samhita is about women in in spheres of modernity and the urbanized world dogi two sisters is about the misfortunes of gauri forced to become a prostitute in bombay to to save her family from annihilation total collapse her return to the village later on and with her sister about to be married raises a storm and even the mother initially refuses to acknowledge her in fact almost disowns her but there is a shift and and this you say also constitutes the the kind of social political intervention that sumitra was always interested in and let's not forget her training as a social scientist at the tata institute of social sciences so we also look at certain transformation taking place in indian villages with activists entering the village and seeking <clears throat> seeking to liberate the villagers from their oppressive practices it's it's not just feudal patriarchy that that the film engages itself with concerns itself with but also the kind of mythological structure the belief in myths that at the extreme tend to become mere superstitious beliefs in fact the notion of mother goddess is prominent in dogi but you say with the activists and what is interesting is now this is this is very important for us because there are uh, modern theorists who dub the indian context in fact they call it the third world including leftist critics somebody like frederick jameson who refuse to acknowledge that there could be sources of enlightenment that there could be sources of protest within a structure that's generally regarded as rural despotism oriental despotism or or dismissed as village idiocy now it's here that the possibilities of a new awakening of a renaissance shall we say emerge within the feudal structure so if modernity should make inroads at one level it's also possible for human beings and this comes out of the experiential depths of human beings we cannot ever believe that it's only western modernity or colonial modernity that brought in an awakening in all of us if you look at the story of the of the last couple of centuries there were radical interrogations from within traditional cultures indigenous cultures and if you have the activists at one level you have krishna gauri's younger sister who stands by her sister is even prepared to walk out of the marriage and make sure that gauri gets her redemption salvation redemption salvation in a very secular temporal sense bada addresses the question of superstition and again we turn to the familiar pattern of rural societies tribal societies damning women as witches so all those associations of sorcery black magic witchcraft now these go hand in hand with the plight of the dalit woman sarja bai the the questions of caste class conflict are very central to sumitra bhave's films so she is ostracized sarja bai threatened threatened that her house will be burned down but you see it is in this context that that you begin to see that there is somebody like sakubai traditional wisdom wisdom operating out of her own dense experiences of life who shows ways out who shows alternatives so even on one hand if if you have a certain context of oppression tyranny of brutality it's out of that landscape from deep out of that landscape that you begin to see alternatives emerging 
And the narrative structure of both Dogi and Bada are, are woven to resonate the spirit of the land and also the, the time spirit, because in one area, it's wrong to believe that time is frozen in a particular area. Even if you move to tribal societies, even if you move to what we regard as primitive societies, barbaric societies, it's utterly wrong to treat them symbolically to make this argument that they are all frozen in time. We need to turn to the dynamics of traditional societies, of indigenous societies, and look at the complex processes that work within. This is also because the use of the word modernity needs to be used. When we use the word modernity, we need to be careful. Our societies, indigenous societies, do they undergo transformation? Do they undergo a metamorphosis only through external influences? Or do such societies have their own dynamic cultural practices? Now, these are very important questions. And whatever goes in the name of today, the well, fashionable at one stage, not anymore, of what post-colonial theory means. Now, is it only the intervention of the outsider, the modern modernity, Western modernity that brings in changes? Just, just to give an example, if you turn to Chinua Achibes, things fall apart. In fact, you have gone to the African tribal society, far more primitive than the society that we are dealing with in Dogi and Bada. There, even as Achibe, things fall apart, talks of colonial modernity entering, Achibe does not disguise the fact that tribal societies had their own cruel barbaric practices. But even when you look at those barbaric practices, even if you look at those brutal practices, as if modern societies, our societies do not have all those brutal practices, it's possible for Achibe to show, going back to his ancestors, that there were areas, that there were spaces of redemption, salvation. And one of the great figures that appears in Things Fall Apart is a man of immense wisdom called Obirika. So even if that tribal society, African society was masculine, celebrating masculinist values, there's also a feminine streak, a kind of streak. It may not succeed, it may not triumph, but there are those voices. Why, why is this important? This is important because you see, there are, there are two dangers when, when we uh, turn to our so-called primitive backward societies, whatever terminology one uses. One is to fall back upon the orientalist position of trying to valorize the past, glorify the past, a phenomenon that we have come to see in recent years, decades. And, and the orientalist position, the orientalist vision is to endorse everything the notions of a glorious past, glorious tradition. If that's one danger, it has its binary opposite. Now the occidental position of regarding oriental societies as dark, mythical, superstitious, barbaric, with no sources of hope, and to look at Western models. Now this is the Europe, Eurocentric model. So are we to construct only two models and understand our notions of societies of the past, cultures of the past, with only two lenses giving us some sight? Are we to see only through those lenses? And that's why you see Dogi and Bada become very important because there is no villain, there are no villains, there is no caricaturing. So Sumitra Baba and Sunil Suktanka do not embrace the Orientalist position while trying to understand it. There, there's an acknowledgement of all those dirty, dark, hideous practices. But it also doesn't mean, even as a social theorist, Sumitra Baba doesn't draw from, from notions of sociology, anthropology, cultural theory, cultural studies constructed in the West. And this, this is very crucial. When we, when we turn to 
Indian cinema of this kind. It's when one turns to Samhita 2013, one journeys into the world of women. But this world of women is through creative works. You have a documentary filmmaker who has been asked to make a feature film, a creative writer who has written a story. So, so the, the existential predicament of women is examined. And this, I think, is very central. To, to create through creative processes, not through theoretical models, not through what we generally recognize as the feminist theoretical models. Turn to Mahashweta Devi, turn to our major Indian women writers in Hindi, in Malayalam. The, the sources of understanding, the sources of self-identity come through the processes of creativity, through creative processes. So here you have in Samhita, the stories of Shirin, whose husband, a filmmaker, about to die on his deathbed, wants to fulfill her husband's desire of making a film. Revati Sate, the one documentary filmmaker, but who wants to make a feature film now and Tara Duskar, the story writer. So three stories of contemporary women through a story that Tara Duskar wrote, almost forgotten. It's about, so the real women, the world of real women, the real world of real women now resonate with characters from the world of fiction. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting, complex juxtaposition in Samhita. That's why the documentary filmmaker Revati says, when you make a documentary, you look at people on whom you are making the documentary, you look at them through your eyes. Look, look, at, the, look at the creative dimension of Samhita, but in Samhita, she says, when we write a script, borrowing it, not making a documentary, but a creative film. Samhita is about the process of making a creative film, a fictional film. We look at ourselves through those fictional characters. So it's not that a documentary which holds a mirror to reality is everything. When you enter the world of creativity, when you enter the world of fiction, the writer of fiction, the maker of a fictional film will also have to understand her, herself or himself through the characters he or she has created. So, so there is, a, there is a, re, a, a reverse process in Samhita where real women try to understand their asmite, their self-identity not with reference to the world of reality, but with reference to two fictional characters. And here, the, the, the most important concern is to concentrate on a relationship. And, and that's the relationship between a king and a musician, Bhairavi. Satyashil is the king and Bhairavi is the musician. A relationship built on intuition, on passion, on unbridled love, which, which both of them experience spontaneously. So the creative process is a mirror. Samhita is a, is a very complex, interesting text because I think imaginary characters, imagined characters lead us to understand by interrogating many of our existential realities but to seek possibilities of different self-identities. The, the struggle is to overcome the fixed identity, the identity that I have, that I have lived with, that I have inherited. But how do I go beyond that? How do I transcend this? And this is where a very complex relationship is established between fictional characters, the world of imagination, and, and the world of reality. But even as it is done, 
one of the one of the most subtle aspects dimensions of the film is also about cultural inequality you know without resorting to loud pompous theoretical positions the writer says but let's not forget even as we understand the passion of men and women let's also not overlook ignore this element of cultural inequality that does exist between man and woman so these are and of course samhita is a, is a visual treat a marvelous visual treat with extraordinary mountings captivating images and rich in its uh, thematic explorations and samhita is is one of the exceptions because usually the films of sumitra bhave and sutankar sunil suktankar are austere very controlled lot of restraint but there is there is a luxuriant quality to samhita with with spectacular it's in fact an architectural spectacle samhita and therefore you see i i think it's important to understand the creative process of these two film directors by looking at how they create this notion of a script so as you are scripting and i think this is true of all creative people writers literateurs of musicians of painters who gain self understanding self recognition through their own musical notes in the case of musicians through their pieces of sculpture as far as sculptors are concerned through the characters that they have created if they are writers of literature literateurs so samhita is about scripting somebody's life and in turn scripting one's own self identity if if one were to carefully choose i move on to uh, the next segment if one were to carefully choose 10 indian films 10 indian films as the most significant ones to have been made in india during the last two decades during the last two or two and a half decades if if we are asked if i am asked to choose 10 major films as as outstanding representatives of indian cinema i would choose vastu purush 2002 and at this stage i would say and it's also an interesting comparison we must look at the other other very very significant filmmaker girish kasgold and it's very profitable to make a comparative study also to look at look at how their concerns are so different varied these are you see the points of convergence of indian cinema and they are also the points of divergence vastu purush it's very profitable to study and i don't mean comparison at at the lower levels vastu purush needs to be studied with uh, girish kasravali's tai saheb in terms of aesthetics in terms of the richness of texture in terms of the thematic concerns the possibilities of awareness that it gives about certain historical context and individuals so i would i would choose instinctively speaking instinctively vastu purush and tai saheb anyway this is not the time to dig into the details of tai saheb but i think it was very important for me to have mentioned it there are great socio political dimensions and a whole phase in fact a very very careful sensitive viewing of uh, vastu purush will throw open a whole phase of indian political and cultural history and especially the the post independence phase and the post independence phase would also be to be a little more specific to be a little more particular with the arrival dawn of independence so the word post independence would mean 70 years now but this film is situated in the context of newborn independent india do vastu purush 
if if it primarily appears to be predominantly appears to be the reflections of an adult on his entire past in fact there's also a very very complex narrative structure to vastu purush in fact it's baskar desh pandey who has just received the max assay award so at one level the film is a journey into the past his ruminations his reflections but actually through which the whole phase of indian history is revealed of the politics of the times now that politics is revealed to us through the autobiographical narrative of baskar desh pandey so at one level if you see it as an autobiographical journey as images of memoirs it's also a journey to recreate that indian past and opening up again very crucially several aspects of indian rural cosmos so there is a there is a very sophisticated intertwining of the personal and the historical the sociological the political the the historical phase post independence india in fact one of the one of the major aspects of this is about questioning the 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 principles of the gandhian vision and when i say questioning the principles of gandhian vision it is to say what have the visions of gandhi come to in this new india with the arrival of independence does gandhism survive do we practice because no philosophy no ideology no value system means anything without without its accompanying modes of practice in the film itself in the texture built into the thematic pattern content of the film is the mother again one thing remarkable as in the films of girish kasrol you must look at the role the position the context the location of women here's the mother who asks her own husband a freedom fighter gandhian swears by gandhian values the film is about what we swear by in public life you may be a gandhian in public life but do you practice it in the interior spaces your own home she says why did you not get your son married to somebody who belonged to the lower caste because this is about a brahmin family these are sharp interrogations that come from the mother the woman uneducated illiterate says where are your gandhian values and your brother she refers to her brother in the why didn't you get him married again the question of remarriage crops up this is when the gandhian the dichotomy gandhi himself had this dichotomy struggled with this dichotomy and as i as i make these statements let me make it clear we are not making simplistic value judgments we are not moralizing we are not being puritanical but there is also the moment when searching questions have to be asked of ourselves of what we believe in of what we try to uphold in public life the conflicts about gandhi the conflicts that gandhi had within himself so in the context of the film where what has happened to new india and there is also sufficient indication of the corrupt practices that have entered indian political life the other very crucial major strand of vastu purush if gandhi figures to be interrogated to be examined ambedkar so vastu purush please remember as i have been mentioning baskar desh pande is making a journey into the past but through that these historical cultural questions questions of ethical practices cultural ethical practices also emerge the film is also about the new consciousness of untouchabilities and therefore ambedkar figures now one of the great historical dimensions cultural dimensions of the film is about ambedkar figuring the 
rise, the emergence of a new consciousness among the untouchables, depressed classes, as they were called during Ambedkar's time. And it is to the credit of Sumitra Baba and Sunil Suptankar that these questions do not convert Vastu Purush into a sociological text. It's not a sociological treatise. But all these questions are asked of the caste system, of the practices, of the corrupt practices that have already entered Indian political life, public life, through, through creative negotiations. So Vastu Purush is also a juxtaposition of Gandhian notions of self-purification. Gandhi's call to the upper caste to undergo self-purification. This is juxtaposed with Ambedkar's call, call to the untouchables, the depressed classes as they were called, for self-respect. So there are these negotiations established in the film between Gandhi's notion of self-purification and Ambedkar's notion of self-respect. This is why the story of Bhaskar Deshpande ties up with the nurse, Krishna Tai, with his childhood friend, with his classmate, Sopana, because we also see this, this new phase, this new India, feudal India transitioning into modernity, the collapse of the feudal world, but juxtaposed with the emergence of a new caste order, the emergence of the upper, upper the lower caste, the untouchables. There is also a very, very sharp particular reference, which I don't think we should ever miss. And it's about our engagement with tradition, sampradaya, with our notions of Indian tradition. It's again the mother, because you see, you have the brothers-in-law digging for treasure. That's a metaphor. It works literally, but it's also a metaphor. They keep digging for the treasures buried by the ancestors. Metaphorically, it's about the richness, the infinite richness of Indian tradition. Is the Indian tradition so infinite? Is the land a cornucopia? an Akshaya Patra that will keep on yielding, that you dig the metaphor of digging. So there is, you also have the architectural, the archeological metaphor. Tradition can be converted into an archeological archival material that you keep on digging. And you believe tradition is inexhaustible, is it so? This is when the mother says, you see, this is, a, this is also a comment on our understanding of tradition of ancient Indian tradition, she says, tradition will become barren until modernity. Let's not forget it's a woman in the rural context, a homemaker as the expression goes nowadays, who says tradition has to be replenished, recreated, reconstructed, revitalized by the present. So do you keep borrowing from the past, believing that it will give you on and on and on to an infinite degree? Now, these I think are, are very crucial to our understanding of Vastu Purusha. It's against this that you have images of a huge, sprawling, massive vade, again the vade in Thai Sahib, crumbling, going into pieces, and is there a Vastu Purush? Do you invoke the Vastu Purush, the spirit of the house, the guardian spirit of the house, the guardian of angel of the house that will forever protect the house? Do our guardian angels, the ancestors always protect the house or is it our duty, our ethical obligation to rebuild this vade, to rebuild a tradition, to reconstruct tradition, to revitalize it. So we just can't fall back upon this silly nostalgia. There's also profound nostalgia where you construct the past, where you look into the past with, with, with very profound ideas, thoughts, emotions. 
But to simply gloat over the traditional past is only to suggest that we haven't evolved and this tradition is not going to evolve. There is, there is a very, very important dimension here. If we are not careful while watching uh, Vastu Purush, we would look at, we are likely to look at Bhaskar Deshpande journeying into the past as flashback as a throwback into the past. It's not that. And I think we need to understand it with, with great subtlety and sophistication. In fact, the texture of the film makes it very clear that when Bhaskar reenacts certain scenes, it's the present given an agency where we always, as we do, as all of us do, that we look at certain stages of the past, our past, turn to certain pages, uh, phases of our past, and decide that we could change it, that we would change it if only we could. So there are certain areas, childhood experiences, certain phases, when Bhaskar, the adult today, looks upon the young Bhaskar and creates a sequence in the present, he creates, imagines a different past when he could talk to his brother, when he could talk to his mother, when he could change the past. This, this is not a flashback, but this is the kind of complex relationship that we consciously and unconsciously establish in the present with our past, almost like saying, how I wish I could have changed. We know that we can't, but there is this impulse, emotional, intellectual impulse, this feeling, and none of us is exempt from this. And it's unnatural if we don't have such feeling. How I wish I could change. How I wish I could alter it, knowing very well that it can't be done. This, this is the complex experience of Tolstoy's story, the death of Ivan Illich, about to die, awaiting his death to saying, how I wish I could relive my life. How I wish I could recreate my life. So it's a very, very complex question of agency. The relationship between the past and the present, that relationship is built on complex feelings, complex attitude, impulses. The impulse to change the past is an impulse that comes to people who have different desires, who have different dimensions of feeling and thought. Also because we know very well, if we are sensitive, we know that the traces of the past, that the present carries many traces of the past. And these traces can never ever be erased. So we, at least in imagination, at least at the level of feeling, level of feeling, which is an important dimension of human existence, we are always trying to reconstruct the past, not with regret, not with any degree of sentimentality, but the mind asking us to change several things. And this, I think, is, is a very fundamental existential, experiential dimension that human beings carry, that to wish that many things of the past could be corrected. So at several stages, these journeys are made as interventions, as conscious, unconscious interventions, only because of a certain ethical sense. And what is that ethical sense? If the past cannot be changed, if the past cannot be altered, the past cannot be altered, but it can be altered at a different level. When we try to come to terms with the conflicts of the present, when we try to come to terms with the ugly dimensions of the present, and there are indeed ugly dimensions, and therefore to say, I will rewrite the past in the present by eliminating those traces, by eliminating those cultural traces that continue to harass us, continue to trouble us, and continue to create stories of misfortune for many, untouchability for that matter. 
So there is an ethical dimension, there is an ethical aspect to the kind of aesthetic structure, the kind of so-called flashback that Vastu Purush creates in its scheme, in its design. But it's actually a journey into the past only to learn from the past, the lessons of the past, to struggle to build a different future, a new future. These are visions of an alternative India, which is why you see this story ends with Bhaskar trying to build a hospital, asking his son and American daughter-in-law to come here. But that's a different story. I think, I think we should look at all these. I, I move on to the next phase. And uh, the three films, and again, to repeat the statement that I made at the beginning, I'm not going to inquire into the relative merits of each film. So that's, that's a different study, that's a different dimension for another occasion. But I'm only trying to point out to the three films because they are the three openly political films openly political in the real political sense. In fact, to a large extent, they move on the lines of a documentary, but they're not documentaries, they're fictional films, but rooted in certain phases of modern Indian politics. And the three films, and you, we, we are free to construct our understanding of the ideology of Sumitra Bhave and Sunil Suktankar through these three films. They are A Cup Chai, 2009, and, a, and more of a documentary interspersed with fictional elements, more Dekne Jungle Me, in the jungle, journeying into the jungle to look at the more, the peacock, 2010, and Ha Bharat Maza, 2012. A Cup Chai 2009, More Dekne Jungle May 2010, and Ha Bharat Maza 2012. The, the interesting point is, so there is there's a certain different understanding of politics in these films. So even when I say that political films, it's only because they're rooted in certain socio-cultural geopolitical realities. But this politics, the politics of these films is, is through individuals, their explorations, their journeys, and the manner in which they make a different journeys through these socio-political, geopolitical realities. A Cup Chai is about a conductor, bus conductor, Kashinath Savant, and his struggle because he gets a whopping bill, electricity bill of 73,000. So a cup chai, the structure of a cup chai draws from the RTI, the Right to Information Act. You have a, an activist there, an NGO worker. So these are all the documentary elements of a cup chai. But what is worked out, the fictional part of the film is about the aspirations, the aspirations, the bus conductor, very, very ordinary life, standard of living being quite low. The film is about the aspirations, the dreams of people struggling to move up, struggling to liberate themselves from these areas of poverty. So if you can read A Cup Chai as a documentary at one level with all details about the Right to Information Act, I think we should also struggle to see how it's also about the interior spaces, the inner realities, the internal struggles of individuals of a certain class. And as I said, about a bus conductor and his struggles with his family, with his daughter's son, and their aspirations, their dreams. So we also look into the private worlds of imagination, of dreams, of desire, of aspirations. But what concerns, what the film unites is public questions, questions that dominate in the public realm, 
public sphere with with certain questions that concern the struggles of individuals and each one with one's own man or woman with aspiration struggles for a better life so what do you do with individual dreams what do you do with individual aspirations and how do we understand in my understanding the film is also about what do we do with the dreams aspirations of the commons and i think it's in this sense that a cup chai moves into the area into the realm of the commons how does one sensitively understand how the pulse of the commons beats so we also move into the area of the commons in a cup chai more dekhne jangal mein is a journey literally and metaphorically into the tribal areas so so if you are to look at the politics of the film from a point of view of a documentary this is a journey into tribal life tribal culture tribal customs and tribal life tribal civilization we shall use the word tribal civilization indigenous civilization in the face of modernity development progress growth the mantras of a globalized global capital economy there is a face off there is a confrontation between the two and as this confrontation takes place the film lets loose in a very subtle manner the image the metaphor of a peacock the dance of the peacock and that i think is the creative question we must engage ourselves with when we look at this more film the peacock film the peacock trail going in search of the peacock the trail of the peacock with all our questions questions of reality questions that come from economic forces brutalizing centralized economic forces of a global world of a capitalist world and as we make our journeys the basic question is do we lose sense of certain primordial primeval aspects of nature and the most significant thing here is to look at the joy and this is not a social realist political question that a, an ordinary documentary would throw up for us how do you experience the joy and here it's about a peacock do you create a civilization do you create an efficient competent competitive competitive civilization where you do not have nature where you do not have the joy of the animals the birds and you have lost even the impulse to lose the impulse to listen to the songs of the birds to watch the dance of the peacock so this works at a metaphorical level the question that the film asks i understand the film as a film that throws up a question what is it then that should keep the so called competitive modern civilization going what would keep it going if it loses its sense of aesthetics that you forget that you erase you you don't erase just the forests the tribals but you also erase the peacock and this is the metaphor that comes up in more film that jungle that you travel to the jungle you enter the tribal civilization only to behold the pure spirit of joy that comes by watching the dance of the peacock when you turn when you turn to ha bharat maza now now this film is is about anna hazare's movement let's let's look at the the structure of the film at one level it's india against corruption the anna hazare movement and the kind of idealism that it generated especially among the young people of india and also the middle class a certain kind of idealism 
led by Anna Hazare, his journey, his fast, his eventual arrest, his release, and the birth of the Aam Admi Party. So at one level, it, it seems to indicate a kind of regeneration among the commons. And of course, a great section of the middle class supporting Anna Hazare's movement. But what is crucial to our understanding of the film is that from this public space, public realm, it moves into the world of middle class families. The design, the structure of the film is the journey with the TV images, news reports, news telecast of the movement, Anna Hazare's fasting. It is again very carefully woven with the texture, the fabric of the film tells us two stories of our practices, of our struggles as middle-class individuals. So one major segment of the film revolves around a family of Sukatme, a factory worker, an employee in a factory. But if you look at it, then you must ask questions. It's, it's so easy, so perhaps comfortably easy to ask questions of others, raise questions of integrity as far as others are concerned. But should you turn inwards, what about the compromises that we make in personal life? What about the compromises that the middle class makes? Again, you see, let's not forget that these are not subject to severe puritanical judgments, value judgments are not made. What is the imbalance that the middle class itself creates? And who are we to judge anybody? But we must understand this complex relationship. Even as we talk so much, shout at times pompously about public values, how then do we look at our own compromises, the collapses in our schemes of integrity, only because we are also struggling. We make compromises because it's a world that demands compromises. Idealism beyond a point does not work, cannot work. So how do we generate our resources of hope? How did we create? Because you cannot expect human beings to retain their integrity in a corrupt system. You do not ask for martyrdom. You don't expect martyrs. Unless there is a struggle, a concerted move to create a society where you have justice, where you have equality, it's perhaps too much to expect individuals. That's why the film controls. There's a certain quality of restraint that we cannot be too harsh on middle-class people, not that they should be exempted from criticism, but then ask the very fundamental question, the difficult question. The most important thing is to ask difficult questions of oneself. How then do we create a public realm, a public phase, a public space where it's not necessary to undergo personal corruption? Let us not forget that answers to very complex social problems, historical problems, do not come easily. They do not come overnight. No such revolutions take place. It's unhistorical to believe so. But to be very sensitive to our own compromises, the compromises that we make for survival, and to survival and to sustain our aspirations. This, this is the, the openly, fairly open political comment that emerges through these films. There's, there's a crucial phase to the films of Sumitra Bhave and Sunil Suktang. And here we enter at one level, the world of illness, mental illness, the world of disease, especially psychological disease. Disease is not at all a good word. Let us say mental deviations or a milder word like mental disorders. 
three films at one level dahavi f which which was made in 2002 section f the the whole film and this is my point of interest the whole film is at one level to be understood as a critique of the colonial system of education in fact the famous dictum thomas arnold rugby chapel the father of the great cultural critic matthew arnold that was when the famous expression came spare the rod and spoil the child if you don't want to spoil the child don't spare the rod use the rod cane the children especially the 19th century if you go through the works of charles dickens the schooling system especially hard times the notion of punishment obedience discipline as necessary steps steps to be taken steps that cannot be avoided to create better citizens so it's indispensable it's inevitable to use the rod to terrorize the student to make the student behave in fact if only we should turn to john stuart mill's autobiography it talks of the kind of death the kind of suicide he almost attempted because of this discipline james mill and he says it's only the the freedom the joy the spontaneous joy that came to him when he read wordsworth this is in uh, john stuart mill's autobiography it's the joy that gave him the release not the oppression of the schooling system the establishment so the joy of poetry the joy of creativity so in dahabi f there is as my reading of the film goes there is a critic of this oppressive educational system that we have built do you make the child behave or do you make the child act with love responsibility for me the film resonates with what bishma bishma acharya says in the mahabharata he says learning education the preceptor must impart knowledge to the young ones to the learners with vatsalya vatsalya is an untranslatable word but it would mean love compassion endearment tenderness caring so dahavi f is crucial in the sense that and we see that today they they the kind of oppression that the entire educational system built on models of colonial modernity have oppressed made students dumb unimaginative that's why i gave the example of sir thomas arnold and john stuart mill there are two other films i want to address after the habif and before that yeah yeah philosophical statement is necessary even in the western philosophical tradition in a certain elevated sphere of western psychoanalysis psychiatric practice there has been this argument that deviations of the mind cannot be understood totally through clinical methods that the practice call it psychiatry psychoanalysis depends on a certain kind of assumption or depends on medicine but there is this sustained argument and there are great philosophers who argue not to say do away with medicine not to say do away with the psychoanalysis but there is a greater realm and of course we know that you have a whole school of anti psychiatry rd laying and others but let's turn to the philosophers who argue that deviations delinquency whether among children or among adults must be seen philosophically 
and surprisingly enough the argument is that it must be understood at a mystical level in fact william james has a book the varieties of religious experience varieties of religious experience martin heidegger's book being in time there are many who draw from this and say we must turn to disorders of the mind and that's that's the soft expression i can use disorders deviations of the mind that me that need to be approached with a sense of healing a sense of healing with a mystical awareness and therefore we cannot be we cannot adopt punitive measures we cannot adopt disciplinary measures when we when we deal with when we come across certain deviations in human behavior devrai 2004 and kasab 2007 devrai means god's forest the forests of the gods divine dev rai forest so it deals with schizophrenia there is certainly schizophrenia but who is this schizophrenic individual he has a sense of the sacred the sacred grows it's an ecological environmental question wakes up he has a split personality but do you understand it merely at the clinical level subjecting it to all your psychiatric psychoanalytical practices or do you invoke other forms of healing the film suggests that the curse of modern civilization that one of the curses among many is that we have lost our sense of the sacred as far as nature is concerned and the struggle is to recover recover the sense of the sacred the sense of the transcendental and therefore to approach many disorders so many disorders many sicknesses of our society are to be seen as social malaise social disease it's it's another kind of an epidemic a pandemic as the word is being used today so how do we look at different patterns of behavior how do we look at people who do not behave as we expect them to do how do you come to terms with let us use the word now abnormality what do abnormalities in individual suggest is it a personal problem is it a personal disease or do you see it as a civilizational problem and therefore kasav it's about a mentally disturbed boy kasav is about turtles which come to lay eggs do you understand certain abnormalities abnormal behavioral patterns in certain individuals as as individual sickness as individual disease or do you try to create a civilizational discourse in fact the birth of the clinic if you should read that french philosopher michel foucault discipline punish and therefore you think of the birth of the clinic in fact certain civilizational thrusts certain aspects of civilization the choices that we make these choices create imbalances within us and there are sensitive individuals who succumb to this so devrai kasav are films if uh, dahavi f is about little children and that they need vatsalya that we have to do away with measures of punishment and discipline kasav and devrai ask us to look at abnormalities the kinds of abnormalities with a sense of the mystical and with an understanding of the great sins of modern civilization it's now that we must turn to astu astu is again about dementia the alzheimer's disease and that's chakrapani shastri but you see there are multiple narratives in the film and the multiple narratives in the film are also about not just 
dementia, about Alzheimer's disease, about Shastri going missing. These do work, but that's the plot of the film. But what are the thematic patterns that we need to construct out of the plot? Which is why you see, as we watch a film at one level, we certainly need to look at, concentrate on the plot, but we just cannot be content with an understanding of the chain of sequence, events, episodes. We try, we have to get those thematic philosophical concerns out of the plot. Then what is this about? Astu, so be it, from which we also say tatastu, let it be so. It's a benediction, it's a blessing. But what does the film suggest? There are enough structures in the film, many segments in the film which show the film is not all about, it is, but it's not all about Alzheimer's dementia. But what is it about? It's about the journey into a certain state of mind a certain state of being. Shastri, a scholar who may quote from the Gita, the Upanishads, the Vedas, a Sanskrit scholar, but much before he's afflicted by dementia when he's talking to his daughter, Ira. And that for me is, is the central concern of the film. What is knowledge? What does knowledge, what does epistemology, what do the various epistemologies, you may be a scholar in several areas, you may handle different epistemological schemes, but what is the meaning of knowledge beyond a certain point? And, and something that resonates in the film is what he tells his daughter. He quotes from the Zen text, from Taoism, and he says, there is no past, there is no present, no future, whatever is, is. So as to let it be so. And the, the Zen statement is everything is provisional, everything is transitory, everything is ephemeral, everything fades away. The, the Madhyamika school of Buddhism says everything fades into Shunya because everything is Kshanika. And the great struggle is also the struggle to therefore to reach a state of Nirvana, mindless, to state it differently, a beyond the mind state that you go beyond the mind. And that's one of the cardinal principles of the Yoga Sutras. What is real yoga? If it is bending, if it's your physical exercise, that's Hatha Yoga. Yoga would also mean Chitta Vritti Nirodaha, the Vritti, the transactions of the mind, of this consciousness, Nirodaha, to stop it. In this sense, Astu is a journey and and there was one, one magnificent great philosopher who understood it, that we reach a state of silence, Ludwig Wittgenstein, especially towards his second text, talks of silence as the ultimate, the Maha Mauna or the Maha Nirvana. So you can make an analysis valid to a large extent about Alzheimer's dementia loss, but there comes a stage when perhaps your knowledge means nothing, but it because it moves into an area of nothingness. Which is why our great scholar, Shastri, Chakrapani Shastri, is as important or less important, or to reverse the statement, the graceful elephant woman, Channama, who comes is perhaps his equal, illiterate, uneducated woman, an elephant woman who mothers him, who mothers somebody who is as old as her own father, perhaps older. So eventually it's, it's a state of wisdom. It's a journey into a state of wisdom where with all your knowledge, with all this scholarship, you move into an area where you accept whatever is, whatever exists without simplification. 
and this acceptance of this truth that everything moves into nothingness is not in a vague amorphous position it comes after you have made the journey through life you don't skip any phase of existence you don't fail a skip you don't hop beyond take a leap beyond the rigors of daily life but beyond that you make a journey into a state where you accept everything and you say as to so be it so be it in 2019 and this is very important when sumitra bave made diti which means seeing a vision there is there is a spiritual question but underlying this spiritual question there is a political position here and i think the film should be understood as a severe scathing critique of all our institutionalized interpretations of religion and spirituality let me state it again it's a scathing critique of all our institutionalized forms and notions because all our religious or so called centers of spirituality have incorporated us and have given us only stereotypes and we stick to stereotypes diti makes a journey into the oral traditions the wisdoms of the oral traditions makes a journey into the not the world of the vedas the upanishads the bhagavad gita the vedantic texts but to the cosmos of the varkari tradition simple pilgrims walking all the way to pandrapur to meet their vittala no knowledge no epistemology no textual tradition no textual practice no rituals simple faith not blind faith but a simple submission to a sense of god to a sense of the omniscient to a sense of the omnipotent so drawing from this oral tradition the varkari tradition diti is about a man filled with hatred anger towards his daughter in law because she doesn't give him a baby grandson because he wants his dead son to be reborn as a male grandson full of resentment but then the kind of spirituality that the film deals with is the kind of spirituality that comes through a very ordinary common day to day physical life when he helps a cow give birth to a calf there are no constructions here diti does not depend on constructs that are of the classical kind constructs that cripple our understanding of tradition but comes from the wisdom of folk traditions of oral traditions so how do you contextualize spirituality what is spirituality in the little things you do in the small things you do in the manner in which you treat human beings the manner in which you relate to each other one another how you treat a human being whether you treat human beings with contempt with anger with resentment with bitterness or with love simple love and the manner in which you live life is the only valid spiritual position which perhaps vitala could accept would accept so if if vastupurush deals with vatsalya if the films dealing with mental disorders so called mental disorders are about healing a mystical understanding of deviations deviance diti is about the kind of vision that india needs to celebrate what spirituality do we talk about of killing people of murdering people with communal instincts that you talk of spirituality that you talk of a deep religious experience and you generate hatred that you create this notion of the enemy within your own tradition and that you talk of a glorious tradition based on killing based on masculinity or do you talk of spirituality or you do you talk of the cosmology of religious traditions through the language of love through the language of compassion 
And I think as a human being, Sumitra lived such a life, struggled to live such a life and completed her journey, cinematic journey with the kind of vision she had. This was her seeing, this was her vision and Diti encapsulates all that. I think I, think I will stop here. Suresh? Yeah, 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 I'm here. It was lovely. And I'm also happy that uh, Mohan Nagashe, one of the regular of all Subhitra Bhavis films is here with us. And of course, Sunil Suktankar is also here. I request uh, Mohan Nagashe uh, can add on anything that uh, he wishes to add on to the tribute uh, for Sumitra Bhavi. Please switch on your uh, speaker, uh, or I'm sorry, mic. Yeah. I will have to put my headset. Other thing, yeah. <laughs> because oh, yeah. <laughs> Give me a minute till then you proceed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very interesting observation made by in Manu Chakravarti, and I think he has touched on almost all the films made by Sumitra Bhave and in collaboration with Sunil Suktankar, whatever she did, and the last film, Deti. And we were, we at Suchitra were really privileged to have uh, Sumitra Bhave with us in June 2019. We showcased approximately around six films then also. And we had a long and exhaustive discussion with uh, Sumitra Bhave. And uh, it was, uh, it was like talking to a granny, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of uh, uh, talk that we had. She taught us with her compassion, with her uh, love towards filmmaking, with her love towards narratives about what is filmmaking. We remember every moment that we spent with uh, Sumitra Bhave, those three days. And we missed Sunil Suktankar those three days because he was uh, uh, down with fever that time. He was not able to join us, of course. Now that uh, uh, our boss uh, Agashe is ready, uh, <laughs> I wish him he'll be able to speak some. I hope you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now the thing is, okay, right. Well, I'm very glad, I'm so glad that I listened to Manu and has read his interviews. And um, I must uh, be honest with Manu, I'm still trying to find out uh, the simple language to communicate to masses yeah. that how Sumitra has converted complex things simply to communicate to ordinary people. Yeah. And it may be because she came from the background of sociology from Tata Institute. I came from medical background <laughs> and psychiatry particularly, not satisfied with the way things are. And she was not satisfied with the way things were. And we found some common threads. And really I experienced it first time when I actually worked with her in Devrai. Till then, I knew of her, and probably she also knew of me, uh, right? But we never worked together. And you don't really come to know a person really as much better as when you actually work with the person. So all our myths and imaginations and ideas about the person are uh, really made. And that's basically how it started. And the uh, thing I found that her approach to the medical problems, I was more particularly addressed to medical problems. She is the only filmmaker probably in the world who has made wonderful, meaningful films about five illnesses which have high stigma. Zindagi Zindabad, Devrai, Nita, Astu, 
Kasha. Of course, Mada. Mada doesn't come in disorder, but it comes in superstitions. And I find these films extremely helpful to teach my academically swollen friends that what empathy is, what compassion is, and how it can change when we can't change the reality. Suppose there is a chronic schizophrenia, delusions and everything that you can't change. If you change your attitude, things change. And Sumitra has done it extremely, simply by like Manu said. She, she isn't very direct about it, but the way she has juxtaposed Iravati, the daughter of Shastri and Chandamma, both women, both caregivers, one is engaged by analysis of his behavior, one motivated by the acceptance of it, accepting the contradictory positions that this man probably is a very deserving man. She doesn't know anything. Looks like a very learned man. That's why she thinks of him God. <laughs> but still, he needs to be looked after like a child. Well, even in our ritual, you know, uh, we bath the deities of God in daily routine. Nobody has gone to analytical things about it. But these things I found very interesting and used and I have made efforts to communicate, like for literature, a main literature, you have Shakespeare or some novelism and it is taught. These films are, need to be taught sometimes, like complex novel. Okay. And I will end with a small note. And this I started feeling because when we migrated from oral tradition to written tradition, when orators were replaced by writers, what actually happened, word became an orphan. Like in a jatra, the word lost its parents, word lost its image, word lost its sound. As long as there were orators, there was sound and image to the world. And that word became orphan. So whosoever adopted him interpreted his life on everything. But what happened is when radio came, it was like suddenly finding the lost mother on India radio. When cinema came, the father also came. So, though father and mother had met, the child met both the father and the mother. When talkies came, the whole family came together. Right. And what gets communicated through image and sound before even language came, because world, because image and sound is older than the language spoken or written, right? So it's traditional. And now in the digital world, I say currently, the whole family has found an affordable house. This, so come together and Sumitra has used all three very significantly. So neither she went after the artistic, uh, non-comprehensible to ordinary people, artistic. That to me, my expression is more important. So I do my films like painting, do it. That's your privilege, okay? I do my films to entertain. But what is ignore, and then my last sentence is, whenever you see film, there is no other medium like film which transcends conscious boundaries. Bergman has said this. It goes directly to subconscious and unconscious. And it gives you passive information. Like a smoker gives you passive smoking. Right? You're not aware, right? And if this passive information, and unfortunately cinema came in the hands of 
commercial people who used it primarily for business. And that is why the dangers of passive information are worse than smoking. Smoking can damage body. This passive information can damage mind, which is shown by the stigma, which all these illnesses have. And Sumitra has successfully used the same weapon to combat stigma. So I find them very handy. First of all, for me to understand issues which are beyond medical, and there's a simple uh, line I like it. You can read a novel of 1000 pages in one day. Why can't you read a textbook in one day, which is 1000 pages? Because textbook does not have subtext. And life is full of subtext, which Sumitra understood. Thank you. So kind of you, Agashi ji. Okay. Yeah. And I now request Sunil Suttankar to add whatever he wishes to add as a collaborator to most of the films made by Sumitra. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And uh, we uh, from Suchitra also wish to thank Sunil Suktankar for providing all the six films that we were able to screen online. Once again, we thank Sunil for that. And I now request Sunil to speak a few words yeah. on his collaboration. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, Manoji, thank you very much for analyzing all the films. Uh, I always love to listen to you uh, because uh, actually, you know, uh, I would like to say that we understand our own films more when you listen to you. So, uh, and it's not a humble statement because you have uh, a various uh, tools of analysis with you to uh, analyze uh, the text and subtext as Dr. Agashi said. Uh, and similarly, I uh, now uh, again and again, I keep realizing that uh, Sumitra uh, uh, was a combination of uh, two different persons, I would say. One was uh, the social researcher who believed in uh, analytical tools. And uh, she was uh, an intellectual and philosopher who analyzed things. But when it came to writing the scripts, the artist in her uh, used to overpower that. So uh, she used to sort of internalize her own analysis and research and everything into her uh, uh, personality. And the artist in her would instinctively express uh, into uh, uh, a kind of intuitive uh, expression. So uh, the expression was never uh, dry or loaded with uh, analysis, but the, at the back of the whole thing, there lied the, uh, the structural analysis and all her understanding of society and caste system and tradition and uh, about the illness, uh, its uh, depiction and all that, uh, human relationships and psychology and all that. So, but when it uh, came to expressing it, uh, it was an artistic expression. So that was a very interesting uh, 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 the, the combination. Uh, her personality, which I understand, uh, had both these uh, uh, sides. And uh, uh, again and again, I keep realizing that it was a very uh, unique combination of uh, uh, you know, in one person. So that was a great thing uh, I uh, remember about her. And thank you so much. And uh, as, as I said, I was uh, remembering Zindagi Zindabad and Nitar and uh, uh, Gomal Aslava, two, three other films. Uh, someday I would really love to listen to you at length, you know, let's sit together for one or two days. Well, welcome home, Fir welcome Zindagi. Home. Yes, yes. But thank you so much for uh, the categorizing all these films in various interesting way. And that was totally new to me also. So thank you so much, Madam, and Suchitra Films as well. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sunil Suktankar. And uh, uh, we have had almost uh, close to uh, one and a half hours of uh, discussion right now. And there are no specific questions raised by 
any individual either on Facebook or on uh, online chat. So uh, if uh, Manu has anything else to add on to what, uh, what has been discussed either by Agashi and Sunil, we can have a small discussion and then end the session. No, I am I'm, I'm in total agreement with uh, what uh, Sunil ji and what uh, Agashya ji have said. So I, I really don't have much to add, except that given another one and a half hours, I'll go on the uh, di discussing the other films. So that's for <laughs> another occasion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so kind of you, Manu. And uh, uh, this... Uh, uh, I think approximately around uh, 40 people were there as participants on this online discussion and the FB live has reached close to 600 people. And we have uh, had a greater audience to discuss on Sumitra Bhave and give the tributes to a great filmmaker that we ever had. So, Suchitra, at this juncture, would like to thank Manu Chakravarti for giving his time to discuss Sumitra Bhave extensively for almost close to one and a half hours. And we also thank both Dr. Mohan Nagashe. I, I wish to thank Mohan Nagashe for giving such a beautiful uh, film like Astu or even Ditti, the kind of, uh, the, you know, the, the actors, you know, the Bhajan uh, Mandal, that kind of a role, you know. Uh, and then <coughs> the kind of performance <clears throat> that is done by Mohan Nagashe in even us too. And once again, thank uh, Sunil Suktankar for join, joining us. So Chitra, on the whole, would like to thank everyone who has participated in this online discussion. We would like to remind you all that the Satyajit Ray centenary celebration will begin on So Chitra's uh, online screening today evening at uh, approximately around 5.30 p.m. We'll be showing, showcasing five of uh, uh, Satyajitre's film and two documentaries made about Satyajitre. And then there will be a discussion by Girish Kasarwali on Satyajitre on 5th May, 5.30 p.m. online. And the next week, we have uh, uh, a discussion on one more uh, stalwart of Kannada cinema, Hunusur Krishnamurti, one of the famous filmmakers uh, from the mainstream Kannada films. And K. Puttaswamy will be discussing on the films made by Hunusur Krishnamurti next Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Let us keep on meeting till this COVID is over, at least on online platforms. Let us keep on discussing filmmaking. Enjoy the Sunday. Enjoy the Satyajitri Centenary in the evening also. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. There is one question, uh, Manu. Uh, I think uh, you have also seen. There is almost a difference in generation between you and Sumitra. How is it that you could work so closely in so many films? That's Probably for this... Sunil ji. That's for Sunil, Sunil ji, not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sunil can answer. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, to uh, tell briefly that uh, yes it was a, a very interesting kind of a collaboration uh, a man woman collaboration a different generation collaboration uh, but i think uh, she uh, had a capacity to become uh, a friend crossing the barriers of gender and uh, uh, the age difference so that's how uh, it happened and uh, actually you know uh, right from uh, my college days, I started working with her even before I went to the Film Institute. So it was a collaboration. Uh, we just started working together and slowly the unwritten rules of collaboration and the division of creative labor started happening slowly as we uh, started, uh, kept making films. So uh, in a way, we grew together as filmmakers. So in a way, it became our joint uh, identity. So uh, it was not uh, a difficult thing to work together. Thank you so much. So at the end, we once again thank everyone thank who has you. been a reason and a support for this online discussion and for everything that Suchitra Film Society is doing. We thank everyone once again and end this session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Manuji. Thank you. Thank you, Sunilji. Thank you, Agashe, sir. Thank you so much. See you. See you. Bye.